Do me one more favor. Give God a louder praise than that. He is infinite worthy of all the praise. Amen. You guys can be seated. Um, if you, if you're, this is your first week joining us, or if it, it's not your first week joining us in the series, we're in our fourth week of the series, and uh, the series is worth the wait. And uh, you might see like decorations up here, and you might see these windows, and you might be like, "What are those doing up there? What is that?" And um, I'm not going to talk about peeping toms today or anything like that. Just so you know, we're not talking about creeping in on people's windows, nothing like that. It's going to have a meaning in the stage design. Um, and if you guys could, let's just give it up for the stage design people, the people that serve uh, and, and all the people here, because I believe that we really do. I believe that um, a place doesn't make people. People make a place. Amen? And so I think that what we have here is I think we have a bunch of fun-loving, great, Christ-following people here that aren't afraid to admit we're not perfect, but we serve the one who is. And so I think that that's just beautiful. Anybody with me on that? That is just awesome. So we're in this series, and in our title of Worth the Way, we're basically, we're backdropping everything um, from the Old Testament. We're kind of pointing everything to the need of a Savior. We needed this baby to come, amen? We needed this Savior. We needed Jesus to happen. We needed Christmas to happen because on our own, I don't know about you guys, but I fail miserably in my own efforts. And without Jesus guiding us, without Jesus leading us, without Jesus, without the thought of Jesus, sometimes, let's be honest, we give up. We do. I don't know where you guys are in this room this morning. I don't know what place you're in. But I know you might be in a tired season. You might be in a weary season. You might be in a season of discomfort. You might have a lot going on. You might feel overwhelmed. And sometimes it's important to understand not to just believe in Jesus, but to identify with Jesus. Amen? Hebrews 12 says it this way. It's not going to be on the screen. Not going to be on the screen. Hebrews 12, it says it this way. It says basically in verses 2 through 3, I'm going to paraphrase it here for you. Does everybody like my paraphrase stuff? Okay. Basically, it says this. Jesus, how many people know the cross was painful? Anybody with me? Can you imagine that? The cross had to be painful. I mean, he was beaten down. It was bad. It was bloody. It was messy. It was painful. It says Jesus had to, he had to look at the joy ahead. Amen? He had to look at eternity, and he had to look at heaven. He had to look at all these other great things. And I can just hold this thing here, and I won't have feedback, and that's good, too. Um, but you, feedback's good sometimes, as long as it's good feedback. Okay, so he had to consider the things that laid before him so he could deal with the momentary pain that he was about to be in. Amen? And it tells us in Hebrews 12, 3, to consider him who face such strong opposition, that way when we're in the same opposition, we don't grow weary and we don't give up. How many people know Christians give up every day? It's a sad reality. People are committing suicide. People are leaving churches. People are running from God. People are doing all this crazy stuff, and it comes back to one thing. And I thank God for this in my life. Years before I was a pastor, God gave me two callings that really helped me go into this, okay? One was being in the military, and, and number two was being a trainer. In personal training, you see people give up on themselves all the time. You see people coming with goals, they really want to do it, and then they just like dive off two weeks later, three weeks later, four weeks later. And here's why. And I want you to remember this in this room today. We make emotional, rash decisions and get ourselves in trouble, yes? One decision usually blows a whole thing for everybody. That's not the God we serve. When you fail, that's the reason of the cross. Jesus died for your failures, for my failures. Jesus died for everybody's failures. That way, whenever we're in that mopey, poor is me, woe is me, I can't believe I did this, Jesus saw it coming, didn't he? Jesus, A4 mentioned in the Bible, had already went to the cross, yes? He's already done what he's done. But in our emotions, in our anger, in our stupidity, can I just be honest and say that? We make these rash decisions because we don't get our way. Because things didn't go the way I wanted them to. Church isn't a, a hierarchy. Church isn't designed that way. Church is... For the people of the people, Jesus. And so when you come in these doors, what I want you to know is, yes, you all matter. But most importantly, Jesus matters. 
And if you're here today, regardless of what walk in life you're in, regardless of what season you're in, regardless of what you're getting ready to face with the holiday season and in your family, struggles, whatever, Jesus isn't caught off guard. He sees you right where you're at, and he loves you more than you can imagine. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this series. We thank you for this awesome church, this congregation. I thank you, God, that you've, uh, you've allowed me in your sovereignty to uh, pastor and lead such a phenomenal group of people. I pray today that we would all grab a hold of one truth, Father. We need to kill our emotions. We need to learn to get a grip on ourselves so that we could run the real race in life. You didn't run an emotional race. You didn't make emotional decisions. You gave a sacrificial love in the person of Jesus. And I pray today that we would be people of sacrifice and not emotions. In Jesus' name, amen. How many people have uh, ever been uh, eyewitness to something crazy in here? You've ever seen something crazy, seen a car accident, seen somebody like die, seen something like traumatizing events, right? Okay. As a little kid... I was a part of the biggest heist in history known as my grandpa. He was a, uh, he was a free beneficiary of all retail stores, a.k.a. a shoplifter. Okay? Now, grandpa at this time was 63 years old, and I was four years old. Can you imagine this? Four-year-old kid, okay? So put this first picture on the screen that I have up there. How many people in here remember these things? Do you guys remember that? The pick-a-mix station where you get to pick your own mix and you weigh it and everything? Okay. My grandpa loaded his pockets full of candy. I remember the first time this ever happened. Out to here, like obvious. Shirt out to here, coat out to here, everything. Like it's obvious grandpa's lifting something here. Okay, this is like this. You aren't even hiding it, dude. This is just stupid, all right? And so he's lifting candy, and it didn't just stop there. He's like, hey, open your pockets. I'm four. Okay, I'm four years old here. Open my pockets. He starts dumping them in mine. We've got endless butterscotch the next three weeks, okay? We're good to go, right? So so time goes on. And I remember thinking, because you don't really know what's going on. I remember thinking, this is, you start thinking, this has got to be wrong what we're doing, right? I mean, you start picking up on some clues. Nobody else's grandpa takes them into shoplift. Why is mine? You know, like, what's going on here? And, And so a little bit of time passes on and it advances into the next thing. Put that next picture up. Okay, now what would happen is the the next big act I remember in life is my grandpa had this overhead clock radio thing, okay? It was this alarm clock, and it was over the bed, and it had this light bulb attached to it, right? It was a little, back in the day, light bulbs were like 77 cents. Anybody remember the good old days? Okay, that was like 10 years ago, by the way. It wasn't even that long ago, okay? They used to be real cheap. Now they're like 40 bucks. You got to like co-sign to get a light bulb now, okay? And so 77 cents, not that much, right? I mean, it's not expensive, okay? So his light bulb would burn out. Okay, he had the need for a new light bulb. So what he would do is he'd go steal the light bulb. He'd shoplift a 77. Need I mind you, my grandpa had an awesome retirement. He was one of the most hardest working guys you would ever meet. 45 years in the iron workers, he had a, he'd kill him. I mean, he really did good. He had a good retirement. I never understood why grandpa would spend $500 in scratch-off tickets but lift a 77 cent. It just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, I don't, I don't know. But so anyway, so he would go in, and what he would do is he'd steal the light, but it wasn't good enough. It didn't just stop there. What he would do with the package once he stole the light, he'd go home and he'd put the light bulb in, and then he'd take his burnout light bulb, put it in the package, go to Walmart, return it, and get 77 cents. <laughs> Does anybody else have a problem with this? I mean, I'm a little kid here. I'm four, five, six. Some of you guys like wheels are spinning. Don't do it. It's not worth it, all right? I remember, anybody in here ever overreact? Real quick, anybody in here ever underreact like your wife is wanting you to react to some things and you just don't? That's me, okay? Like the world's coming down and I'm like, Jesus is here, it's fine. You know, don't worry about it. Everything's going crazy and I'm just, my wife's like, just respond. I'm like, I I respond to weird things, I'm sorry, okay? And so some people overreact, some people underreact, okay? So I had this years of watching my grandpa do this crazy stuff and it all came to a head, okay? As, as kids living in Marthasville, Missouri, we had one big outing every month that we looked forward to. We went to the Schnooks to go grocery shopping, which was down in Mid Rivers, okay? Poor trailer park kids going out to go shopping. This was a big event for us. This was, we looked forward to it. It was a great time, okay? It was the first Saturday of every month after the retirement check came in. We went and did this massive shopping trip, okay? We're in Schnooks, and 
Grandpa has got his new idea. This one I just wasn't ready for. And the way I reacted was crazy. Anybody know what that is? That is a cheese log. It's a Colby Jack cheese log, okay? It's not an object that's meant to be stuffed down your pants with your eight-year-old grandson watching, okay? He went to lift this cheese log. My grandma's at the other, the store is packed, right? We're in St. Peter's, all right? He goes to put this thing down his pants. I'm like, Grandpa's stealing! I remember yelling it just as loud as can be, right? And he grabbed this cheese log and just threw it like a football. You know what I'm saying? Imagine this, right? It was crazy, <laughs> all right? I wasn't on Grandpa's good side that night. Wasn't good. But we've all overreacted. We've all been there. We've all dealt with enough and when enough's enough and you blow your lid. Anybody ever been there? You hold up, you hold up, you store up, and then you blow up, right? Everybody been there, right? So you guys can understand today that when we start talking about emotions and we start talking about reactions, sometimes we judge people off the way they respond to us without knowing what's really going on in their life, right? And sometimes if we could just put ourselves in that person's shoes for just a second, we'd probably be responding the same way. We'd probably be acting the same way. We'd probably be the same exact person, but because in our sheltered lifestyle or whatever kind of lifestyle we come from, we can be the people that point out and judge people. Amen? And so today we're going to be talking about Moses. How many people in here know Moses? Hear that name, Moses, okay? I'm going to ask for some participation here. When you hear Moses, what's the first thing you think of? Huh? Part of the Red Sea. A success. Anybody else? He wrote something that was kind of important. Ten Commandments, right? And one of those commandments that I think that everybody in here seeks to honor is what? Thou shall not, well, close, kill. Okay. I mean, anybody here murdered anybody lately? Don't raise your hand, okay? Do not raise your hand. If that's you, don't raise your hand. We wouldn't do that, right? I mean, we just would not do that. In your head, you're not like, my wife tells me every day she's going to kill me, and if I show up or don't show up next week, you know why, but I don't think she's really going to kill me when she says that. So I keep going and push her buttons a little more, a little more. Maybe she will one day. But I don't think for the most part anybody in their correct stage of mind is going to kill anybody. I just don't see it happening every day. I don't, I don't ever walk up into Walmart and be like, oh, he just stabbed him to death. Great. Let's have a good day. No. So if you see a murder, are you going to freak out? Anybody with me in here? If you eyewitness a murder, if you eyewitness somebody getting beat, are you going to turn that into the cops? I mean, I hope if you walk to the side of Walmart and you see some guy kicking some guy, I, I think you're going to make a phone call because you don't just see that every day, right? So when we start talking about Moses and we start talking about things, we've been in the seventh book, correction, We've been in the ninth book, we've been in the 17th book, and we've been in the 32nd book in the first three weeks of our series, 39 books in the Old Testament. Now we're going to totally go back, remix, right? Second book in the Bible, the book is called Exodus. If you guys want to flip there, that's where we're going to be at today. And what's happened here, just a little backdrop so we all know where we're at, is in this story, Israel is in Egypt. Well, Israel's supposed to be in Israel, aren't they? I mean, if you're from Warrington and you are wake up tomorrow and you're in Florida, well, it's... I think some people in here are, but if you do, you're going to be like, and it just happened, you're kind of like, something had to happen in between, right? Israel doesn't just end up in Egypt. So what happens, and what we're going to talk about next week, is we're going to talk about Joseph and Jacob. How many people know Jacob's name turned to Israel? Does everybody know that? Everybody's going to the Bible? Okay. We'll talk about that more next week, okay? So what happened was Jacob had these sons. All of his kids got jealous of the one son because he was more handsome, kind of like me and my brother. I'm sorry I'm the handsome one. You know, I can't help it. Anyways, that was a joke. All God's people said, ha ha. And so anyways, we got Joseph here, and Joseph has been sold into slavery, and now he's in Egypt because his brothers got jealous, right? I mean, that's essentially what happened. So now Joseph dies, and Israel's stuck in Egypt. Well, there's a problem. There's a big problem. There's a huge problem. There's a new king. There's no more Joseph. Israel is in a place they should not be with a king it really shouldn't be leading. I don't know what you guys look for when you follow a leader, but I want to know he's got my best interest in mind. Anybody with me? I want to know he's thinking about me. 
So what starts happening here is Israel's not only in Egypt, but what you're going to find out is Israel's job is slave. They had taskmasters appointed over them. They had people that were barking commands, mistreating them. Does anybody have a problem with that kind of environment? You should. Mistreating people. God frowns on that, by the way. And so they had these taskmasters assigned over people, and Egypt is treating Israel horribly, and out of it comes this beautiful baby, right? But you got to know a little bit more. You see, today's message is reverse, reverse. How many people have ever done the cha-cha slide? What happens if you reverse, reverse? You end up in the same direction you started from, right? And the takeaway spin of today's message is simply this. Is it up on the screen? Reacting to emotions sets us back. Responding to God's truth springs us forward again. Could we all agree on the truth of that? Is there validity there? You act out in an emotion. How many people have ever gotten into an argument with their spouse? Maybe on the way here, maybe last night. Father, forgive me. And so you respond in emotion. Emotions get heated. You react. They react. You react. They react. It's this big ping pong game of hatred, stupidity. And then in the end, what did it accomplish? Nothing. Just a waste of time. Can we be honest? Can we just say that this morning? Arguments are a big waste of time. You get your way. I get my way. When we come together, we got to form everybody's way. And if we keep paddling back and forth, nothing's ever going to happen. Amen? And so there's got to be an agreement at some point. There's got to be some point where we look level at it and we say, okay, you know what? The cool thing, can I tell you the coolest thing about church? Nobody gets their way because Jesus gets his. That's good. Is that not worth praising him for? I don't get my way. You don't get your way. Nobody gets their way. We get Jesus' way. One way to heaven. That's good news. And so we respond because of truth. If you're in here today, before the offering even comes up, because you know if you've ever been here, the offering's going to be at the end of the service, okay? We've got a lot of needs in the congregation right now. We've got a lot of needs that, you know, I've been reaching out a lot, a lot, a lot in our community. There's a lot of hurting people. It's Christmas time. I don't ever want you to give impulsively. Deal? Don't ever give out of emotion. If you give out of emotion, what's going to happen? Because I've seen it happen every time it happens. You do one big gift, then you're gone. Because you're going to feel bad. I shouldn't have done that. Church wants my money. I don't want your money. Can I tell you good news if you're in here today? God doesn't need your money. He's God. He's got it all. Is that good news? God doesn't need anything that you and I could offer, but God wants it because it's just obedience. It's just being good to him. It's, it's being gracious to what you've been given and blessed with, okay? So what you're going to see here is you're going to see at the end of the service every week, there's going to be an opportunity to give. Some of you will, some of you won't. I don't care. I mean, I do, but I don't. Hear me correctly on this, okay? What I want more than anything else in this congregation is I want people who want to be in line with God's heart. Giving is one of those ways. Doing things, serving is one of those ways. If you don't do that, guess what? God still loves you because it's not performance-based. Isn't that good news? You could be in here and you could never give a penny. You're still saved. You could be in here and you could give the rest of your life. Guess what? You're still saved. Can I tell you the common denominator? The cross. It's not a performance-based relationship. Do more means I get more. No. That's ulterior motive. That isn't the cross. The cross is simply understanding that Jesus has done it all, and because he's done it all, you really shouldn't work so hard. You really shouldn't try so hard. It shouldn't be about looking better. It shouldn't be about looking worse. It should be about this. I give because he's first given me. It's a response of love, though, and not of emotion. Because what will happen if we're emotional givers is if I preach the wrong message, you don't give anymore because I made you mad. Or if I preach the wrong thing, then you guys don't show up to help me and serve. Right? But what happens in the consistent lifestyle that Christ has called us to is we always give, we always serve, we always love, we always do these things. Why? Because he first did them for me. Amen? And so what's going to happen today is you're going to see is you're going to see somebody get spared of death would anybody have a problem with this? The firstborn male, if born, because Israel is oppressed, right, in Egypt at this point. Israel's oppressed in Egypt. Would anybody have a problem with this being a national rule? If a baby is born and it's a male, 
we've got to drown him in the river. Is that pretty harsh to anybody else in here? I got a problem with that. I do. I'm sorry. I've got a problem with that. As a person, I've got a problem. To, to, I, I carry my son in a car seat every day. If I see you with the car seat that's in a river, I'm probably going to kick you in the temple, and it's not you, it's just me. It's an act of love. Because I can't imagine what would make somebody do that. So we have this oppressed nation, Israel, in this place, Egypt, with rulers, with slaves, with all these things. How many people know God has designed us for a life of freedom? Yes? God hasn't designed anybody in here to be a slave to anybody. The Bible talks in Proverbs about how we're never to be a slave to the lender. That means if you continue to borrow money from people, guess what? You're always going to be a slave to the lender. You're always going to have to work. You're always going to have to, how many people have experienced this in buying houses, buying cars, buying things? The more interest I accrue, the more payments I make, the more I never really get ahead, right? It's kind of the Christmas trick, isn't it, though? I want to get you to emotionally, think about this. You go in the store, the right music's playing, right? It's always that Christmas music. And it like, it basically is screaming, go to the sale in aisle eight because your kids need this. But they don't really need that, do they? There's not really anything that we could really offer. And, you know, I say this, and guess what? I'm going to get my son a nice Christmas. Just so you know, I'm not saying don't do these things. I'm saying remember the most important things. There's nothing that you and I could really give our kids that's going to be as beneficial of what God can give them. Yes? The most important thing is a relationship with God through Jesus. Do you guys agree? And so what happens here is there's this rule that you need to drown the baby. Exodus 1.16, it says this. When you help the Hebrew women give birth, observe them as they deliver. If the child is a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, she may live. How many ladies in here don't really have a problem with that? Like, guys have hurt me. I'm good with that. Drown them, jerks. <laughs> and so, anyways, what happened, though, is that if you're a boy, you're supposed to die. Well, how many people know Moses got spared because he didn't die? And not only did Moses get rescued, but Moses got rescued by a very special person, if you remember this story. Pharaoh's daughter. The king's daughter rescues Moses. Can anybody see God's hand at work there in Moses' life? Can anybody see God blessing Moses? Can anybody see God kind of moving towards Moses and saying, guess what, just like Jeremiah 29, 11, God has a plan for everybody in this room. Does he? Yes. Do you believe it? Yes, absolutely. God's got a plan for you specifically. And here God demonstrates, Moses, I'm going to spare you, but I'm not just going to spare you once. I'm going to spare you again because God is a God of grace and second chances. If you're in here and you're on your 12th chance with God, guess what? You can have 40 more if you want it, but you're just going to hurt yourself a lot along the way. Because he's that good. So Pharaoh's daughter saves him. And anyways, here, long story short, Exodus 2.10 says it this way. When the child grew older, which is Moses, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she, he, now all of a sudden he went from supposed to die to in the king's palace. Is that kind of a weird turn of events to anybody else here? Like you're supposed to die, dude, and you end up in glory. You're supposed to die, but you end up in this heavenly, exalted place. You're supposed to die, but you end up here. It sounds like the gospel to me. Do you know everything that you and I have done is deserving of death, but because of what Christ did, we get eternal life. So basically, we're already in glory by making that decision to follow him, yes? And, and so what happens is she named him Moses. And it literally means this, because she said, I drew him out of the water. I saved him from being a drowning baby. Now, there's going to be a problem, and there's about to be a really big conflict of emotions and interest and everything else, because Moses knows who he belongs to. He does. Unlike many Christians that get away from church and they forget who they belong to every week, Moses knows whose he is. And you're going to see a question as this story plays out, and, and he's going to ask this question in the long run to God. He's going to say, well, who am I? And I think there might be people in here asking that question this morning. Well, God, who am I to you? Because everybody else doesn't appreciate me. Who, who am I to you? Because my family, really, they aren't really showing how much I, th I matter to them. Who am I to you? Because my boss, my employer, they never really give me any kudos. Well, who am I to you? And God, when you say that, this is the first thing he's going to say. Don't ask who you are. Ask whose you are. 
If you've accepted Jesus Christ, you belong to the Most High God. And that exalts you above everybody else. The Bible says the least here will become the greatest in heaven. Is that good news to anybody else in here this morning? The least person here, the person that we all go out and judge every day, could perhaps end up being the greatest in heaven. And so she spares this, this child, but Moses remembers who he belongs to. He remembers, wait a minute, I'm different than everybody else. I'm an Israelite in this Egyptian place, and I am watching my people get mistreated every day. Has anybody ever watched their kids get treated unfairly? Has anybody ever watched their kids get their heart broke? Has anybody ever watched a loved one get hurt, get used, get played out? Something bad happened to somebody that they really, really care about. And what happens? Does that instinct rise up in you? Right? That emotion kicks in. I'm going to handle this. I'm going to sort it out. I know, God, that I trust in you, but right now I need instant gratification, so I'm taking the wheel. Oh, don't leave me hanging up here. Don't leave me hanging up here. We do this all the time. And in Exodus 2, 11 and 12, you're going to see the biggest downfall of Moses' life. We, we worship his success when we think of Moses. We think he wrote the Ten Commandments. He parted the Red Sea. But just like everybody else, how many people know everybody in this room has had a rough past? At some point, you've been through a struggle. The degree, I don't know. Every person in this room has walked a tough mile, regardless of what your definition of that tough mile is. Some choose to rejoice like the Bible says, like we're supposed to in our sufferings. Some choose to complain. It's all emotional based. How do I feel that day? But here is the struggle and here is the challenge about emotions. If I only worship God when I feel good, what do I do with the other 75% of my life? Yes? If I only thank God when I'm getting stuff, what do I do in the 80% of the time where I have to give? If I only praise Him when everything is blistery awesome in my life, well, what do I do when I'm in the valley? Do I just give up on God? Because I can assure you if you're in here this morning and you're in the valley, the valley isn't designed to kill you. It's designed to bring you closer to God. And you need to learn to praise in those times. Downfall of Moses. Ex Exodus 2, 11 and 12 says it this way. Years later, after Moses had grown up, now Moses has been in a palace. He's, been, he's got a good treatment. He's got a good life. He is blessed, right? I mean, he should have died. God spared him. He went out to his own people and observed their forced labor. He sees my Israelite people, my people of my gender, my family, my people are being mistreated, okay? He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. Anybody else going to react here? You see somebody kicking your kid in the face? Come on, raise your hand if you know you can put yourself in this scenario. You see somebody treating your kid? You see somebody treating your... Okay, we're going to at least have words, right? I mean, if, if you'd stand by as a parent and you'd watch your kids get treated this way, I don't know. But sometimes you have to, don't you? The sad reality of life is this. Sometimes you have to let go and let God. Sometimes you can't hold their hand all throughout life, and at some point you've got to break that covenant and say, you know what, my covenant and trusting in God is more important than coveting my relationship with my kids. Yes? So he watches his guys get beat. Looking all around, seeing no one, okay? So imagine this. It's like my grandpa shoplifting, right? Is anybody watching? Is anybody watching? Pick up a hammer, kill the guy. Think about this. I think you'll get a better reaction if you actually think about this, okay? Everybody creative real quick. He looks around the room at Creekside Place Church, sees nobody, and hits the guy on the front row with a hammer. Okay, you guys are just boring. <laughs> he killed the guy. Moses killed this guy because he couldn't take anymore with people around. The Bible says that he looked around. He, could, he might have been in Warrington Walmart for all we know. He looked around like we look around sometimes. If people are watching me, I'll live this way, but when they stop watching me, I'm going to do my own thing. That's an integrity issue. That's a hard issue. Because all the time, God is watching you, amen? Not just some of the times. Moses looks around, he whacks this guy in the head, 
kills him, and then what does he do? Buries him. I, how many kids? Have, how many people have ever watched their kids play with those little those sand toys? You know what I'm talking about? You buy the bucket. At, okay. Imagine your kid outside burying your other kid with one of them sand toys. Is this awkward to anybody yet? Somebody's got to be seeing something now and saying, uh, this doesn't look right. Is anybody with me? If you see a guy getting buried in public, unbeknownst, you're going you're gonna to ask some questions. It's going to be a weird day. There's an awkward moment in there somewhere. You're not just going to walk up and say, hey, how you doing, Moses? Moses, you're a murderer because you let the emotions get the best of you. Now, funny, when we look at the Old Testament, like I say all the time, the New Testament's actually rougher than the Old Testament because Jesus actually taught that if you have hate in your heart towards anybody, you're a murderer. And it's no longer the physical that matters as much as it is, what? The heart. The matter of the heart. So he strikes this, this guy dead. He hides him in the sand. And what's going to happen next is going to blow your mind. He's on the run from God. Does that surprise you? Forty years. For 40 years, Moses ran and fled after he committed this crime. Because why? A, he was a wanted man. The king and the king's people wanted him dead. You can't treat people like that, right? But B, his relationship and his covenant with his God, because you got to remember, he's an Israelite. He's God's chosen. He's God's elect. God had spared him. He knew God spared him when he was a child. So now he's on the run, and he's more than anything else, not about the legal side of things, but now what's happened is his relationship with God is fringed. You might get in some legal trouble, and you're going to have to pay some fines, but if you get into a eternal struggle that's a little bit deeper because you can't pay them fines you got to trust that jesus paid them there's nothing that you can do once you've done the sin all you can do is do the forgiveness of the sin i'll say it again there's nothing you can do when you do the sin the only thing that you can do is ask forgiveness for the sin don't try to cover it up don't try to push it off. If you lied to people, you lied to people. If you did something wrong, you did something wrong. If you're doing a shady deal, you're doing a shady deal. Bottom line is bottom line to God. But we're going to see God's still faithful. Verses 23 and 24, God's going to keep his promise. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. Moses is in the sand on the run from God 40 years later. The Israelites groaned because of their difficult labor, and they cried out, and their cry for help ascended to God because of the difficult labor. So God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God sees this, and I know that I just said that fast, but here it is. God remembers every promise he's made with you. Yes? God's not like your mean stepdad or your crazy uncle. He doesn't lie to you. He never has, he never will, and he never can. Hebrews 6.18 says, it is impossible for God to lie. There are people in this room who have changed their relationship with God because of something a person has done to them. Psalm 118.8, the message of the Bible is this. Guess what? Humans fail, God doesn't. If you're emotionally responding to God because of the reaction that people have given you, you're wrong. Because God can't fail you. So God's going to keep a promise that he made. He's going to rescue his people, okay, right? And can I tell you what's so cool about God? God always notices his people. Exodus 2.25 on the screen. God saw the Israelites and he took notice. Who in here has accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? By raising your hand right there, you have just identified that you are just the same as the Israelites, and God notices you regardless of what you're going through. He's not leaving you out in the dry. He's not leaving you in the sand. He hasn't forgotten you. He's got promises that he's made to you, but he needs you to be faithful in the promises he's made to you, and he needs you to be active regardless of circumstance. He says, hey, I'm God. I don't care about your circumstance, but I do care about your eternity. There are people in this room God's made promises with you. 
and you think God's forgotten about you, and I want to tell you, far from abandoning you and far from leaving you, God sees right where you're at right now, and he wants to make it brand new with you. So God notices people, and what's he going to do? In the middle of a desert, and we all know this story, right? Moses is roaming around, do do do. A bush is on fire. Does that happen to anybody else every day in life? Walking to do my garden, hey, there's a burning bush. It doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. And if it does, here's the mirac- miracle of what happened. Guess what it is? That there was a fire and the bush was not consumed. Look at that right there. I want to read this. 3 2 and 3 3. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him. Why? Because God had made a promise with Moses that not only am I going to deliver you as an infant, I'm going to keep delivering you as an adult. Not only when you're good, but when you're bad too, I still love you because I am God and I created you. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire but was not consumed. Does that that strike anybody else odd? Those, those words there, Moses noted, but look, but it was not consumed. Does anybody else notice those words? But was not consumed. I think that there are some people in this room that your life looks like it's on fire, but guess what? God's not going to give you more than you can handle. You're not going to burn down. You never burned down before, have you? And you're not going to start now. Why? Because God is faithful. God sees his people. Your fire, your bush, what it is, can I tell you, everybody in here is a bush to God that needs to have a fire on the inside of them. That fire is Jesus. And when that Jesus is on the inside of you, God notices his people and God sees his people. And he said, guess what? There's one that won't be consumed. Everybody else in the world might be consumed, but that one right there has my son living on the inside of them, and they will not be put to shame. Why? Because the Bible says whoever believes in the Lord will not be put to shame. Does anybody believe that in here this morning? So Moses thought, as anybody would think, I got to go check that bush out because what is happening? And as he gets closer, the bush starts talking to him. Now... We're starting to take too many happy pills. This is getting weird. What? When the Lord saw, because guess what? God's noticing everything you do and how you respond to things. And as you respond or as you react to the gospel, as you do the obedient things, as you give, as you offer, as you serve him, as you do the faithful things, guess what? God's not going to forget you. He's heading over to check out this bush, and all of a sudden, Moses... Uh, I'm like here, I don't know about you guys, but I'm thinking, that bush is on fire and it's talking to me, this is weird. He starts, keeps walking towards it because something's drawing him. Moses, again. Isn't it funny that God always knows your name? The Bible says that you are specifically, uniquely, fearfully, and wonderfully made in the book of Psalm 139, 13, and 14. And God's got a plan and purpose for your life. God's got a calling for you specifically. God loves you. God hasn't forgotten about you. By the way, God created you. And he didn't just stop there, but he sent his son after he created you to redeem you to him. Can you imagine being these people? in a foreign land, in a way away place, and they've got no redemption because they have no Jesus. He starts walking to the bush. And, you caught me, Lord. I mean, at that point, you just got to confess, right? I mean, the bush is on fire. It's talking to you. Okay, God, I repent. I don't want to be blown up. This is getting weird. Here I am. That's all it took. Here I am, he answered in verse 4, and then the conversation ensues. And as the worship team starts heading up, there's a conversation that's beginning to ensue right now in every heart in this room. And the conversation that God wants to have with you is this. Are you living for me or are you living for the world? Because I see everything you do. I haven't forgotten about you. I've kept the promise with you. I've stayed faithful with you. But are you staying faithful with me? What's us look like? Moses in the middle of the desert after murdering a guy, by the way. How many people in here would have a hard time accepting a murderer at the church? He just committed murder, and then he walks in. Blood, you know, axe, everything. I mean, you got to picture this guy in the front row, too. What did God do with him? He restored him. I don't care what you've done if you're in this room this morning. God wants to restore you. I don't care how far you've gone. God still loves you because God's 
relationship with you is not like Mopar's with Dodge. It's not performance-based. He's not looking at your life and keeping a record of all your wrongs. Matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us love keeps no record of wrongs. And John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that what did he do? He gave. So if God loves us, if God gave to us, then God can't keep a record of wrongs, which must mean this. God's pretty awesome. God's pretty fantastic and super in a way that no human being could be. So Moses is traveling over to the bush because he's wanting to see what is happening here. And the conversation starts going, and in Exodus 3, 11, and 12, it says this. Moses asked God, underlined on the screen, who am I? Lord, who am I? And I know that there are hearts in here that feel this if you want to be honest because nobody's too good for God. Humble yourself real quick. You've got to ask the question at some point in life, who am I, Lord, that you would send your son for me? Because if you haven't, that worries me. Who am I? Wretched man I'm I, Paul said. Who could save me from this body of death? Thanks be to our Lord, Jesus Christ. Romans 7, 24 and 25. There is only one person who gets glory in the end, and his name isn't Stephen. His name isn't whatever your name is. Fill in the blank with whatever. That's getting chopped in the end. It's only Jesus. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God, you want to use me to deliver people? You saw me murder. You saw me run. You saw me, even after you were so good to spare my life, you saw me, and, and I'm guaranteeing you, Mo, Mo, God, Moses has talked. God's probably like this. Moses, you're like some chick on Friday night with ice cream watching Lifetime movies. Get a grip. Get a grip. Cry me a river, Moses. Use your emotions all you want, but I'm God and I don't change. I'm not emotionally driven. I am spiritually driven. John 4, 24 says, My true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. God is spirit. God is in emotion. So if you're in here this morning and you've had a horrible week, guess what? It doesn't have to be horrible anymore. If you're in here this morning and you've had a horrible life, it doesn't have to be horrible anymore. If you're getting ready to go to a horrible family situation for Thanksgiving, guess what? If you put on a garment of thanks, Thanksgiving, get it? You won't have a horrible Thanksgiving anymore. The common denominator today, church, is this. Are we responding in truth? Are we reacting in crazy emotions? I will certainly be with you, God says, and this will be the sign to you that I've sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt, you will all worship God at this mountain. How many people know God kept that promise? Did God keep that promise to a murderer? God's going to keep his promise to you. Everybody's head bowed, everybody's eyes closed, and maybe you're in this room, and maybe you'd be thinking, you know what? I haven't kept my promises to God, though. God's kept all of his to me. He's watched me. He's he sent his son for me. He's performed a great life for me. He's given me a calling. I've got gifts. I've got abilities. I know I've got resources. I've got time. I've got talents. I've got tools. I know that I need to do more for him. Guess what? You can't do more until you accept more. This is not a performance work-based religion. This is grace that saves you a free, undeserved gift of life. And maybe you're in the room and you just be honest this morning. And you're working too hard. You keep laboring. You keep hoping that maybe if I do this for these people, let's be honest, we all do this. If I do this, this will change their response towards me. I'll get accepted finally. They'll stop looking at my wrongs and they'll see my rights now. If I, if I get them a better gift on Christmas, maybe it'll make up for the times that I slapped them in the face. How about that? Just put it blunt. If I get them more for Christmas, it'll make up for the bad childhood start they had. If I get them more, then that will equal a better response. Guess what? God's not going to give you more because he can't give you more. He gave you the most when he gave you Jesus. If you're in here this morning, you'd be honest enough to say, I got a few feathers clipped and I need to learn to fly right, and I'm not doing it right now. Could I just see your hand, just an honest act of submission before God? Maybe your attitude's off. Maybe you aren't thanking him like you should. Maybe you're not worshiping like you should. Maybe you're not, you're not doing the Christian life. Maybe you just stop doing it. Maybe you, like Galatians 5, 7 says, you're running such a good race, who cut in on you? It couldn't be your master. Or maybe you're the person in this room, because I see all those hands and I appreciate your honesty. 
Maybe you're the person in this room that you just literally don't know if, 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 if now the kingdom comes, if this is the last trumpet, if we go out and something happens, then maybe you don't have the assurance of salvation in your life. Could I just see your hand if you just say, you know what, I don't know if I've got a spot in heaven. I don't know that I'm really truly saved. I kind of wonder sometimes. I kind of have led to doubt. I've kind of had reasons. And maybe I've made it too complicated and I forgot just the simplicity of Jesus. Thank you, thank you. See those hands. We're going to pray and then we're going to do an offering. Father, we thank you so much that you saved us when you sent us your son. We thank you, God, for all the glory that resounds on this earth because of you, because you're the creator of all. We are just a creation. The creation doesn't deserve praise. The creator does. Well, I thank you, Father, for the people in this room. I thank you, most importantly, that you created these people in this room. I thank you that this week you'll help us to see through emotions. You'll help us to see through bitterness, through anger, through resentment, through all these junk feelings. And stop overreacting. Father, help us. Because you aren't surprised when you see these things happen. You aren't calling the Trinity up freaking out, so why are we? Father, I just pray for a fresh fire, a fresh start, a fresh season. As we encroach on the weight that is Jesus these next four weeks in this series, we know it, Father, it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait to go through some hardships, to go through some pain, some oppression. Because just like Hebrews 12 says, we need to consider the joy that's before us. I pray for those that are able today to give. I pray that they give honestly. I pray that they give earnestly. I pray that their giving would become a response of worship when they understand that they give to the one who gave them life. Father, we love you, and this is an opportunity to worship you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you that you sent Jesus to die on a cross so that whomsoever believed in that name would not perish but have eternal life. And we ask for your forgiveness today so we can run the race and for diligence, for endurance, so we can keep running faithfully because, God, you are faithful and you deserve us to have a faithful race before you. We love you. We praise you. And as we drop our offerings on the way out, it is a response to the love you showed us. In Jesus' name, amen.